Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to all of you in this very particular webinar. I am Bradatta, your host for the day, and I would like to welcome all of you. And I hope you all are excited for this webinar as I am. I would like to introduce the special guests of today's webinar, the speakers of the day. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Javid Ahmad Bhad. He is an assistant professor in Department of Political Science, LPU, Fagwara, Punjab. He has contributed significantly by publishing numerous papers on the broader theme of reservation, political, and peer reviewed. And he has also actively participated in national and international conferences. He has also had the opportunity to take undertake a visiting fellowship at Ubon University, Thailand, where he explored cross-culture studies. Furthermore, he has also hosted a uh, attended speaker as a speaker in a lot of webinars as well. And the list goes on and on. And, and he has a lot of knowledge to share, which will be shown in this very particular webinar. Now, I would also like to welcome Dr. Zahur Ahmad Wani. He is an assistant professor, Department of Political Science. He has an experience of more than five years and he has published 14 papers and his teaching areas are western political uh, physio philosophy right philosophy international relations contemporary political theory and he has a lot of knowledge to share with you guys as well and also i would like to welcome dr gurjit kaur madam is an assistant professor of political science school of liberal and creative arts social science and languages her area of interest are russia security and gender and she would be sharing an new knowledge in this very particular webinar to all of you guys and uh, now I would like to request uh, the guests to be on the screen they have already shared the presentation they are on the first page and if you guys have any queries just let uh, us know in the Q&A section that you see down there or also in the chat section so over to you sir uh, thank you thank you very much uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, we all are say, gathered here for a webinar on the uh, dynamics of world order. Uh, it's uh, very vast in its uh, scope, uh, though uh, ranging from economical point of view to political to military to security to mm -hmm. number of range of other subjects. Though we would be categorically say focusing on the, say say pertaining to our area of specialization, though I would be say beginning with uh, that uh, the changes that have just uh, taken place in the recent past, uh, we have seen these uh, the changes has uh, globally uh, happening day in and day out. And because of these changes, we have seen uh, there are uh, the new emerging patterns in the cooperations and in the dialogues among various countries of the world. And in response to these uh, changes, uh, we have seen the numerous uh, challenges and opportunities are being posed to different countries of the world. Uh, we do have the we are, say, say concerned uh, by a range of vast, say, subjects uh, ranging from the globalization phenomena to climate change to the, the recent pandemics, uh, terrorism, human rights, conflicts that are going on, and the other issues that are requiring the collective action and the shared solution between the different countries of the world. And we have seen this change, uh, the dynamics that's been attributed by the different phenomena. We have seen the, the aspiration is for the expansion and the diversification of the existing multilateral institutions, though UN, IMF, World Bank, and so other organizations. It's there to include more voices and perspectives from the developing world. Uh, uh, specifically from the global south. Uh, 
uh, and the creation and the strengthening of these uh, new regional and sub-regional organizations, uh, um, be it the BRICS, African Union, Association of the Southeast Asian Nations, and European Union, that aims uh, actually to promote uh, the regional integration, uh, development, uh, security, uh, cooperation, and the number of other phenomena. And the emergence of all these informal networks and initiatives, such as the Alliance for Multilateralism, G20, Quad, that also seeks to address the specific issues or challenges that transcend national boundaries and require coordinated action. The recognition of multipolar reality of the world where no single country or bloc can dominate or dictate the global agenda and where do different actors have to engage in dialogue process and in negotiations so to find out the, the uh, common ground and mutual benefit for each other. Uh, though there are the reasons for all the, these, these uh, changes that are there, we have seen recently, uh, we have seen that this has been, say, say the, the major dominant uh, phenomena in the, in the international relations, rise of China and its expansion policy. So one of these primary reasons behind the decline of the existing this multilateralism is the rise of China and the, uh, as, a, as a global economic and military power. And China's uh, expansionist policy, both in Asia and globally, that challenged the existing world multilateral order. And it's, it's unilateral efforts to uh, to, to, to alter the boundaries uh, with, with neighbors and its assertive territorial expansionism has created tensions and destabilized the regional and global institutions. Economic and security cuts though from China, this too is, say, ha is having an implication where we see that the economic and the security cuts by, posed by China that has compelled the, the countries like US, Japan, India. So to, we, we, we are there to reevaluate our engagements with the China. So this all led to the efforts to derisic their massive economic interdependence with China, which has implications for existing multilateral economic institutions. Though there are the number of other, say, uh, uh, big uh, happenings that are occurring. We have recently seen the, the uh, in the recent past Russian actions uh, that that the occupation uh, and annexation of Ukraine, Crimea, that big in, in 2014, that has to mark a significant challenge to the post World War security order, that particularly in, in the uh, Europe. This event disrupted multilateralism by causing the different rifts, conflicts in the international community. And uh, there are the contradictions within this multilateral system. Uh, this multilateral system itself it has faced internal contradictions and challenges. These internal disagreements and conflicting interests among the member states have weakened the effectiveness of multilateral organizations and has impeded consensus building between the different uh, progressive nations of the world. And there's the rise of alternate security form in response to the Chinese expansionism, alternate security forms like God, AUKUS, and the trilateral compacts has emerged. These forums are reflecting a shift away from the traditional multilateral institutions, though raising the questions about continuing relevance and the centrality of existing arrangement. Uh, we have the, the changing perspectives of different key players. I have with me Dr. Gurjeet, uh, who is working as an assistant professor, and uh, Dr. Zuhur, uh, who is also working as an assistant professor. They both have the specialization is in IR, and I would uh, just uh, say take them on board for the, the uh, beginning with the Dr. Zuhur, though uh, he would be, uh, say, say, enlightening us about the, the historical context of the, the, this existing order. 
the over to you dr zohor okay. please thank you uh, thank you for having me today uh, as uh, my colleague dr jawed has already uh, uh, given a brief overview of this dynamicism of the existing world uh, why we are discussing this uh, fundamental question uh, because of certain reasons uh, let me uh, use nancy fraser over here as she mentioned in her book smanal work uh, cannibal uh, cannibal cannibal capitalism uh, she basically uh, uh, she basically uh, argued that uh, we are in trouble humans are in trouble why we are in trouble because of the following uh, uh, following reasons number one she uh, says uh, crushing debt uh crumbling infrastructures uh hardened borders even violence different forms of violence not only physical violence extreme climate or simply we can say uh environmental catastrophe uh precocious work culture as well as besieged livelihoods so these are the certain uh certain factors uh, uh these certain factors basically lead us to uh, uh discuss this fundamental question related to the uh, world order so uh, if we look at this uh, this term world or this basically phrase this is not a term only this is basically a phrase as well uh, world order so if we look at the literature of international relations or scholarship of international relations we simply uh, pick up certain points uh, let me try to uh, explain them the first one is a stable world order is a rare thing so why uh, i mean uh, why can't we have a stable uh, world order throughout centuries because uh, when one does arise it basically tends to come after a great convulsion that creates both the conditions and the desire for something new this is the fundamental reason that that why we don't have a particular world order or, or, or continuous or persistent world order so a world order basically uh, needs cyclical state craft sinist and order is basically it it is created it, it is a constructed thing it is it is it is not a born one so we can't say it's a natural one simply we can say it is the external or the or the, or the uh, manufactured or the constructed orders if we look at the world orders they tend to expire in a prolonged deterioration rather than a sudden collapse we can't say that the current world order it is basically uh, it, whether it is dead whether it is uh, whether it is in uh, or or ventilator uh, it, it is not a sudden basically because the, there is a history behind it if we look uh, at the history of international relations so uh, first we if we see the uh, the greek history basically so there we have also seen a war peloponnesian war so the two major city states at that time on the one side sparta and the on the other side uh, uh sparta as well as the athenians they were fighting uh, a war on what simply uh, thucydides has mentioned it simply they were fighting for the power as well as to create a, create an order according to their wish as well as the aspiration then if we look at the 16th and the 17th century whole europe was in crisis why europe was in crisis because of uh, some some says uh, because there was no order there was no stability there was nothing and there was kind of a state of nature while people people were they were living without a state without an order so they according to thomas hobbes people were uh, they were they were basically uh, uh, they were in, in a hell or are in messy condition so 19th century order if we will see after the after this treaty of westphalia basically yeah, i mean 17th century then uh, we have seen uh, other things as well i don't want to discuss those because uh, then it will take a long time yes. one important point that i would like to highlight uh, then i will come to the present if we see the 19th century order uh, it basically uh, followed an earlier international convergence what was that that was simply the napoleonic wars uh which after the french revolution and the rise of the napoleon bonaparte uh he basically uh, ravaged according to some historians uh europe for more than a decade more than a decade not a decade more than a decade 
So after de defeating Napoleon and his armies, the victorious allies at that time, one is Austria, Russia, Russia and the UK, the great powers of their day. At that time, they were great powers. They came together in Vienna. So particularly in 18, 1814 as well as 1815. And when they met over there, so at the Vienna, they set out some principles. So one fundamental principle was that to ensure that France, France's military never again threatened their states as well as their monarchies. This was the fundamental principle. On this fundamental principle, they have created this city in order. But they also made the, the voice choice according to some, some historians. Uh, what was that? To integrate a uh, defeated France. So at that time, they, they, they were showing uh, the approach of influence. If we see the contemporary times, we have the exclusionary approach. So see how they have created this. So this basically, this uh, Congress of Vienna, uh, this has basically wielded a system that is known as the concert of Europe. Now, at that time, historians, they were saying this will persist for a longer period of time. But what happened to this concert of Europe? It also ended. Not because of disagreements over the social and political uh, orders within Europe, but because of competitions on the periphery. So same, we do see these things in, in today's world as well. Then uh, we have seen uh, uh, World War First and the World War Second. And after World War II, some thinkers, they, they, they are saying like this, that U USA hegemony started after 1945, but that is, uh, according to me, that is not the right way to, uh, right way to argue. Because uh, after 1945, we have seen two world orders, not one. On the one side, yeah, we have West dominated uh, order, but on the other side, we have East dominated order. USA uh, basically led to the West and USSR right now, uh, uh, we call it a Russia. So we, ha we have another, uh, and one my my colleague will talk on this. So after 1990, and this uh, world, the Cold War basically ended around 1990, and after that we have seen the liberal democracy. People, uh, particularly uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama, he has he he came up with a fascinating claim that now liberal democracy won the race. It has defeated fascism, Nazism, and all the isms in 1945. And now it uh, basically defeated uh, the another ism, that is socialism as well as communism. So then they say liberal democracy is the basically uh, the ideology or the ideas or the theory that can work for the betterment of humanity. But if we see uh, these thinkers or uh, the West, particularly, they use uh, liberalism as well as the democracy uh, for their orders. And they try to show the world that these two principles are the basically their own principles. They, they, they have started claiming ownership of those two principles. But now, if we see uh, in, in the current uh, context, why, why we put a word dynamics of this world on it? Because we see that democracy is also in, in, in struggle. Why it is in struggle? Because of the following reasons. Uh, there are countless reasons, but few I would like to highlight. One is the polarization. If we see in democracies, polarization is there. And the second one, if we will see, that is the significant inequality. Okay, Because of the, this neoliberal agenda, so inequalities, the inequalities arise in societies, particularly in democracies. Okay, we are not talking about the autocracies or the other isms. Simply, we are talking about the democracy. In democracies, what we see, we see the significant inequality, as well as the third one, uh, widespread economic dissatisfaction among these. If we go through Gallup poll or the other uh, other polls, uh, particularly related to USA, people they are fed up with the with, with these isms. So uh, they are, I mean, uh, now they have motivated uh, with the ism that was basically defeated in 1990, according to their earlier thinkers. And then another reason is this, the explosion of the disinformation if we will see in today's world. In the, in the public sphere, we see uh, democracy struggling. Why democracy is struggling? Because of, of the explosion of disinformation in the public sphere. And then another one, political gridlock is there, uh, another very, very important feature. 
Uh, next one is the spread of digital authoritarianism. What does this digital authoritarianism mean? It simply basically aim to repressing free expression and expanding government power. So if you tweet something about, uh, about, about some sticks, uh, uh, they, they can be removed very easily. So then uh, another fascinating point that is the resurgence of the nationalist politics. So these factors basically, uh, they, they indicate uh, not only the crisis of this uh, the, the current world order, but some indicated the death of what Henry Lewis has basically said and coined the term, the American century 1945. So now we say, uh, as my colleague has already mentioned, the rise of China and the other globe, uh, South globe, South, basic, South, South globe, they have uh, basically deter the influence of the US. Even uh, just one example, then I will uh, uh, stop. Then my other colleague, my uh, two colleagues, they will they will talk on this. If we look at the COVID-19, uh, there is a scholarship available as well. This, this COVID-19, this, this deadly virus has basically exposed uh, the uh, liberal uh, liberal order uh, very badly, as well as uh, uh, one uh, thing that is Trump's revisionism who will take uh, that was also uh, considered a dangerous one. Why it was a dangerous one? Because it attacks the logic that undergrades the U.S.'s global position. So let me stop over over here. Uh, move to uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zuhu. We'll be taking on board uh, Dr. Gurjeet, uh, who will be enlightening us over the different cases uh, related to the dynamics uh, involved in the glo present global order. Thank you, Dr. sir. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful to both of you for covering such large history in last 20 minutes. Uh, and I hope it was it was uh, of very constructive use to all of us because I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to add here. Uh, when we talk about world order, so the, the first thing that comes to mind is that there has to be, because whenever we think of we are humans and we have this habit of compartmentalizing things. So when we say world order, we immediately picture some orderly fashion of arrangement at a certain plane. So what is this plane when we talk about world order? The plane is uh, the global space, the countries, and the arrangement is according to power. Mm. Uh, at different times in history, different powers, whether we can call them territorial states, or they are recent origin, or we can call them monarchical empires, or uh, some sort of religio-political groupings, like in the case of uh, Khalifa of Ottoman Empire, or Pope and uh, Roman Empire, so Roman Emperor and the Pope. So we see that there have been different entities at different times in the world, and there have been some powers that have dominated the flow of a relationship between the other countries. And then there are some powers that have been placed in the middle. And then there are some countries that have just tried to survive their best. And this dynamism is that not a single power has dominated the world throughout the history. So there have been shifts, there have been some countries powerful for some time, other countries came, they took over. So a very, as Sir has already mentioned, that at some point of time, Britain largely dominated the economy and the politics of the world. And then soon it was overtaken by the UN and the USSR. And in the 1990s, when the USSR just collapsed, uh, and 15 new countries overnight emerged out of the USSR, the world, the global space or the world geopolitics experienced 15 new countries all of a sudden. So then uh, the Western side, the, the liberal side, they celebrated because they thought that the only challenge that was there to this very open trade, free market, and free flow of goods and services, our vision to turn the world into a global village where we are all friends, we are all contributing according to our 
capacity and we are all gaining as per our need. So that kind of an idealism, institutionalism uh, got a great push. So in 1990s, when USSR collapsed, there was one country that was so overwhelmingly powerful that it tried to shape the entire world in its image. Well, if you, if you ever want to understand the relationship between the countries or how countries manage all this, we just need to look at ourselves. The most powerful people in the village, they, you must have seen in the movies how the old money rich guy in the village controls the relationship of the other villagers. He adjudicate on the matters of minor people's fights. So that kind of a village leader. So if due to globalization, the world was to turn into a global village, US wanted to be the Sarpanch kind of, a, you can say, image. So we saw that a lot of celebration in the US, people started to claim that US is here to stay. He's the global leader. US is the most powerful country. And we, we imagined that now democracy will prevail free flow of goods and services, but that hasn't happened quite because it only took 10 years for China to emerge and Russia to come back. So this is what we all mean when we say that the world order is very dynamic because the power like blood is very fluid. So it keeps on shifting and going from one country to another country, depending upon their domestic and international environments. So when we talk about world order today, what we see is that United States of America, as it was in 1990, it stood alone, unchallenged, at the helm of the affairs, at the top of the order. But now it, stained, uh, it stands a little bit wobbly and little less in stature, uh, whether economically or politically, but it is still standing. And it still has the greatest volume of nuclear arsenal as well as conventional military weapons plus economic power. So top five, if you, if you look at top five or 10 or 100 country, uh, companies, maximum of them are belonging to US. So economically and militarily, US still is standing, but the new challenges have emerged. China has emerged due to a very, very aggressive economic rise. And Russia has been, don't, when we talk about in Russian discourses, when we talk about it, we don't say Russia's emergence. We call it re-emergence because even in USSR, Russia was the dominant one over all the other republics of the USSR. So uh, Russian re-emergence and China's economic rise and the next step is that they both have almost come together on several issues. So they are challenging this world order that is known as liberal world order. As my colleague has highlighted that the liberal world order came with the promise of democracy. And we see that democracy in itself is under crisis because of political polarization, religious divide, uh, sovereignty issues of the country. So what is what we are seeing today is that US has weakened, but it is still there as the as the village leader we can see, but it is getting old now. So its its place is being claimed by uh, none other than but China and along with Russia. Now, if we look, Russia has a very unique case here because we see that when we look at conventional military abilities, China is way behind US but Russia is somewhat closer to US. So in terms of political clout that Russia enjoys in West Asia, in Latin America, in other parts of Eastern Asia, you see that the political clout of Russia is greater than China, but its economy has shrunk to a, to a very, very kind of, uh, you can say many fold uh, as, as compared to the USSR, its predecessor. So economically, it's the world order is being compensated by China's rise. And politically, Russia is challenging US uh, everywhere, whether it is in West Asia, Iran is close to Russia, is very far from US. 
uh, Israel-Palestine, very careful balancing act of Russia and China, whereas US is outrightly supporting Israel. Uh, in the case of South Asia, our own region, you see that India shares very close ties with Russia. So in any way, uh, India is not in position to either side with US or side with Russia. So that is India's neutralizing India has also worked in favor of uh, Russia and China in one way that uh, India stands alone and independent country asserting its own position. So in a way, if not to weaken US by making India an ally, at least India will not also completely side with US against China or Russia. So the thing is, it's very interesting to see that uh, uh, we call it multipolar world that now US is being challenged by, challenged by uh, Russia, China, South Africa, Brazil, India. So in this multipolarity also, what we see is that the dominant ones are Russia and China. Now, India, uh, when we talk about India, India is at a very, very interesting position here because India has explicitly stated that we don't want to dominate anyone. Uh, China has also stated it, but China's policy says otherwise. Now, India, on the other hand, has no history of ever forcefully occupying any other country's area. Or we have an exception of Bangladesh, but the circumstances say otherwise. Because if India, I always say it in my classes, if India wanted uh, just to break away Pakistan, India would not have let Bangladesh be free country. It would have kept on meddling in its affairs. But India just intervened and then India kept away like a good neighbor. So the thing is, India wants its own policy that we don't want to be dominated by anyone and we want a peaceful world order. Now that, now that kind of a positioning gives India a lot of advantage in a way in this uh, dynamics of world order that India can offer the world an alternative region. Because when we look at China and Russia, they are saying that we want to change the Western system. We want to, if you have IMF, we, uh, or, or WTO and uh, World Bank, we have BRICS Bank. So, but the ultimate, the underline of BRICS Bank and IMF is not very different from one another, or World Bank is not very different from one another. Now, India is at this position that we can bring our own vision to the global level because we are far stronger than we were in 47. And when India had almost nothing as compared to US and USSR in 47, still India managed to launch a successful movement and become the undeclared or sometimes very openly declared leader of the third world. Now, if when if today's India acts like that day's India, we have nothing but to go up in the world. Uh, coming back to just China and uh, Russia before I conclude, uh, China and Russia, uh, they do offer an alternative in terms of non-Western world order, but in this alternative, there is no fundamental change in, say, power relations, uh, say, economic systems. Capitalism still stays very dominant force. Uh, the world still stays very unequal. The democracy will take a push for the worst because neither Russia nor China is democratic. So uh, in these dynamics where the old system is going, and the new system is yet to replace it, uh, we see there is a great opportunity and possibility for India's vision, as well as India can act as a balancer of several superpowers. So, so I think that's, that's it from uh, for now. Yeah, uh, before moving ahead, let's uh, see if there is any specific theory uh, from your end. Yeah, please. Uh, is there any specific query from your end? We do have certain questions, but we will probably cover it up in the last. Okay. okay you okay. can continue with your presentation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and that's a, uh, you wish to make yeah, certain points. Certain points. Yes. 
uh, as uh, my colleague was mentioned about China and Russia. Uh, so uh, let me add a few points related to this. Uh, even uh, we have, if, even if we see uh, the current developments, and these developments basically they have altered the geopolitics even too. Uh, Maldives is the best example in front of us now. Uh, if we look at the China and the Russia, uh, not only they have pushed uh, the regional security organization. Uh, if we look at the uh, some of them, like uh, conference on Inter interactions and conference building leaders in Asia, uh, the collective security uh, treaty organization, uh, the quadrilateral cooperation and coordination mechanism, along with certain economic institutions known to Asia, was rightly mentioned, including the Chinese run Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Russian uh, backed Eurasia Economic Union. Uh, they, they are doing, uh, I mean, uh, one uh, important uh, thing, not only thing, but but it is a, uh, it is also an aspect related to uh, their their policy concern. They exclude the USA. Mm -hmm. uh, so in order to show the world that uh, USA is no more a leader, uh, or uh, they also show the world that USA is not a not a hegemonic world. And as she has mentioned it correctly, that this also uh, speaks. Of that we are living in a multipolar world rather than the unipolar world. Still, this debate is on. Some scholars they say we are still in a unipolar world where USA is dominating, but this assertion or claim has been rejected by so many thinkers, even by those who were who were claiming in the 90s that we have only one uh, ism or order. Uh, even they, they claim this, you know, uh, I mean, we are in the plan. Uh, this also uh, indicates uh, this whole debate, uh, whatever whatever you people have heard from us. So there are a lot of scholarships available on this one too. And if we just put all the scholarships in one sentence, uh, that simply speaks up that liberal vision has lost its appeal. Uh, this is this is basically the liberal thinkers they argued, not in the socialist or the Marxist or the conservatives. It is basically the liberal thinkers, particularly Fukuyama, as well as the Richard Haas, even too. So uh, in this uh, in this arena, uh, what we see, we see nationalism, uh, one uh, important factor, populism, another important factor, protectionism, uh, that basically goes against uh, the, uh, I mean, not against, but uh, closely associated with the isolationism as well. Uh, did they predict that would gain and who, who 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 is in the losing side? They they simply say it is the democracy. Mm -hmm. So uh, because uh, we have seen uh, the dangers uh, of democracy or the crisis of democracy as well. And then they also basically uh, provide us certain assumptions. That is conflicts. Uh, they do talk about that. Con we will see the uh, number of conflicts not only within but across borders. Uh, that would become the common narrative. That would become the the the, the common thing, as well as rivalry between great power, great powers. That would also increase. This, this is true. If we see today's world, and we see uh, there is the increase in the power competition. So uh, why all these uh, developments basically uh, happen? And I have mentioned it earlier. This is not the sudden thing. Uh, this is uh, because. If we look uh, because of these things, if we look, uh, it is only because of the neoliberal agenda. What this neoliberal agenda does, it basically uh, poses threats, okay, uh, by climate change, and if we will see the uh, catastrophic environmental degradation even too. So this neoliberal agenda, not just falling people, it also basically falling the earth. So in today's world, uh, if we look at the debate, so environment is the fundamental or the first problem that people are facing. And they, they, they say, because uh, democracy, liberalism, now neoliberalism, they all mingle these things. And it is only because of these things that uh, we see not only the world order is in decline, the particularly liberal world order is in decline, but we also see the decline uh, in, in humanity only. Okay, let me stop you over here and we'll go. Yeah, uh, ma'am, uh, over to you, as uh, you are having the specialization in gender also. So today we are celebrating the uh, Women's Day, uh, uh, 
uh, also so mm-hmm. uh, what will we have to take uh, so though taking the uh, uh, putting the woman at the center mm-hmm. stage uh, when we are discussing this uh, dynamics involved in the present world or you are your um <laughs> about uh, the the women perspective of international relations we we have a full legit um, school of thought that we we you know we yeah. in our ma courses in yeah. our ma courses we we teach this the feminist perspective on international relations and how they challenge the already power dominated narratives of international relations even some of the candidates are already working in for the theme of this uh, say gender so i i, I yeah. think some of, some of our scholars are working on that uh, one of uh, my scholar is working on one of uh, women yes venafsha yokobi and uh, she is working on uh, feminist uh, no she is working on women in conflict zones and in international power politics how that plays out that wow, because mostly when we talk about big countries and big states and the high power politics we we tend to focus on very male centric narratives like very the entire international relations subject is very masculine so the feminist intervention is that uh, by redefining gender equations in a more equal way we can also bring equality in international relations so uh, quite interestingly another scholar of mine is also working on interventionism in uh, that happened in 90s the decade of 90s uh, uh, it bit reached its peak when us unilaterally or I mean, on its own discretion uh, decided to change certain countries so my scholar is working on china's policy on interventionism and i think several scholars are also working on uh, you have one working on russia yeah yeah one in, in india russia india russia relations yeah so uh, about coming back to this, this feminist perspective uh, the 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 main argument of uh, see feminist approach of international relations or on world order is known as a reflectivist approach like it it belongs to those approaches uh, uh, of critical theory that mean that uh, within states the power dynamics are dominated by men and they are male centric so it's the male centric uh, definitions of power and honor and protection that prevail and while they overpower a country's thinking they also over, overpower a country's foreign policy and its international relations so one very interesting thing about feminist discourse on international relation is that they question this entire way of thinking uh, that started with the industrial revolution in europe so we all know that before industrial revolution europe was all in dark ages where religious dogma uh, along with political uh, orthodoxy they basically challenged anything that uh, that tried to promote scientific temper so it was suppressed badly and finally we see that europe rises up and humanism the focus take, is taken away from god and state and it is given to individual now the feminists say that that age of enlightenment that post industrial revolution thought it when it they talked about human their focus was mostly male exactly. even some of us also even these participants this this uh, experiment again we conduct in our class it is that uh, just close your eyes and picture a human majority of us always end up picturing male human so from there they question that uh, the individualism was a vectivad tha that individualism that humanism it remained very male centric and uh, rightfully so because at that point of time women were merely considered as an uh, appendages to man so who's somebody's wife somebody's daughter somebody's uh, mother so they did not have any individuality of their own so because of that unintentionally they got deleted away from the entire discourse of globalization international relations power politics who dominates who all those things and this has happened because uh, women weren't considered equal human beings 
for the greater part of history. So feminist discourse wants to change it. They say uh, women can bring an alternative way of looking at things and that will, that can revolutionize our entire perspective on power and power relations. So why does state always have to be uh, a very masculinized idea to be protected? Why can't state be a very inclusive idea? So they not only question, they say that international politics is a very high level debate. They say we need to reconstitute family and then community and then state. If the state is equal, women tend to participate equally in all its narratives, then that state will have a very inclusive outlook. And those types of states are more likely to ask for an inclusive international order mm -hmm. rather as opposed to a state like North Korea where nobody has a voice except the leader. So if North Korea is to rise up at the top of the international relations, it's going to make it international relations into its own image. Same goes for US. US political system is so male dominated that we can't expect US to promote an inclusive international order when US as a state is not inclusive enough on gender. Same goes for India, China, Russia and all other states. So this is what feminist discourses they try to highlight, that an inclusive state can vouch for an inclusive international order. And if the states are not inclusive, then obviously we can't expect international or global political order to be inclusive. So, so, so that's uh, it. I think Dr. Zohor is having some yes. more insights uh, for the debate. Uh, yeah. I would like to add uh, one important point. Uh, uh, when this, particularly after World War II, First, uh, when international relation has been established as an academic discipline, uh, as she is uh, very apt in her analysis, uh, why uh, we have seen that feminism in the later stages uh, uh, related to 70s or 80s, particularly in 70s or 80s, uh, because uh, of the two things. One, uh, women, uh, scholarship or the role of women that was not visible in international relations. As she, as she rightly highlighted that uh, USA dominated the whole discourse of international relations. It is basically a male center. But that is the second important point. So because of these two uh, aspects are two elements. One is the women in women who are not visible in the scholarship or their role. And the second one, the uh, realist discourse, realism basically, as hence Morgan to realism uh, is basically had problems or is having problems uh, as uh, she rightly picked it up. Uh, so uh, if we see uh, this notion, this kind of notion, like uh, the positivist notion has been challenged by the post-positive th thinking. So among the post-positivist schools, uh, one is the feminist school of thought. So we simply use the feminist school of thought, but within feminism, we have so many strands or so many brands uh, to add to them. So that also became, that, that is also uh, related to this uh, dynamicism of order, because this, uh, uh, if we look through the scholarship, this uh, order has been created uh, for someone for their purpose, according to Robert Fox. He says it is for someone for the purpose, but here we see this order has been created for someone and for the, some purpose. And the player is very new, that is the US. And then, uh, uh, I mean, it was written around in 80s, 90s, uh, early, early to, to 2000, that this order will collapse and it will collapse very badly. That is what we see in today's world. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I hope uh, both the, the experts, um, uh, the, the inputs which we have get from them, this must be relevant to the audience also. They do maybe have certain queries, so you please come up with your queries. Thank you so much, everyone, for such an insightful presentation. It was wonderful talking you speak on changing dynamics of world and feminism, gender. We got to know so much about these things, even I personally. And I would like to actually apologize to Dr. Javid for mistakenly pronouncing him as associate, like assistant professor instead of associate professor. So ladies and gentlemen, he is an associate professor 
in the Department of Political Science at lovely professional university. Uh, we surely have gotten certain queries, but we are going to cover that up after I call Mr. Rishabh Sharma. He is going to cover up scholarships, eligibility, LPU infrastructure. So over to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bredipta, ma'am. And uh, further, I would like to extend my regard to all, all the panelists. So uh, without wasting much of time, uh, sir, can you please stop sharing your screen? Stop sharing. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Today, we will be discussing about uh, accreditations, approvals, ranking of the university. So I hope my screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. So let's start uh, start with the presentation part. So uh, it gave me immense pleasure to announce that uh, LPU is, uh, has now got NAC grade A++ with 3.68 score on four point scale. Highest score in first cycle of accreditation among all government and private universities. If we talk about accreditations, uh, we also have uh, ICAR, Indian Council of uh, Agriculture Research, NCTE. And if we talk about approvals, we have approval from Council of Architecture, Bar Council of in India, Pharmacy Council of India. List is long. I'll give you a glimpse of each and everything. So if we talk about rankings, uh, World University with real impact uh, has ranked LPU second. In the first attempt, LPU has secured global brand band of 101 to 200. If we talk about total ranking of institutions on innovation achievements, LPU has been ranked third. If we talk about uh, sports, uh, LPU creates history. 12 out of 13 LPU students won gold Olympic medals in all categories, gold, silver, and bronze. Uh, LPU uh, won Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad Sports Trophy 2023. We, we were first runner-up and it was awarded by Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India. If we talk about uh, exposure, in the 19th Asian Games, our student Neera Chopra won gold medal in javelin throw. Abhishek won gold medal in archery. Rest is long. You can have a glimpse. So if we talk about the exposure at LPU, uh, lovely professional university successfully hosted 106th Indian Science Congress, which was inaugurated by Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi. His Holiness Dalai Lama in LPU campus. If we talk about uh, at convocation, uh, then pre uh, President Sri Pranam Mukherjee with the former President of Afghanistan, uh, Mr. Hamid Karzai along with the LPU Chancellor, Shri Ashok Kumar Mittal, Member of Parliament, Raj Sab, Rajya Sabha, uh, then Panas Minister, Shri Arun Jaitli Ji, uh, Venkya Naidu, Gohar Gopal Das, many celebrities also visit LPU campus. You can have a look. MS Dhoni, Sonam Kapoor, Prabhu Deva, Tanvir Kapoor, Akshay Kumar. LPU is also having a in his book of world record uh, by, for having highest number of people doing Bhangra at a single venue. You can have a look of infrastructure of lovely professional university. We are also having uh, indoors. Uh, we are also having Sha uh, Shanti Devi Mittal Auditorium with the capacity of more than uh, 2,500 people. Labs, library, uni mall, here you can get all the basic needs. Even gymnasium is there, polling area. We also have 50 bedded hospital available in the university. So these are a few pictures of the university campus, lush green campus. Night view of lovely professional university. We also have indoor stadium facility. Uh, we have uh, badminton courts, shooting range. Uh, basketball courts, wash. We also have Olympic size swimming pool. Uh, this is the out, outside view of indoor stadium. Uh, now let's go live uh, where we will be discussing about the eligibility of the program. And uh, we will also discuss the fee structure. 
and few important dates and how to apply for it, admissions. So I hope my screen is visible. Yeah, yeah, it is visible. Okay. okay. So now how you can uh, check yourself at home, uh, you just please note down www.lpu.in. This is our website address. When you will go to our web website, you just need to go to admissions. Here, from here, you need to click on 12th undergraduate programs. After that, you need to click on humanities. From here, these programs will open up. We also have BA. We have BA in honors. Specializations available are psychology, sociology, political science, geography, English, history, Punjabi, public administration. We also have integrated BA, BA program. So let's select, uh, uh, I have selected BA program. So if we talk about the eligibility of the program, eligibility is you need to pass 12th class to get admission into this program. If we talk about the fee structure of this program, even curriculum you can check from here. If we talk about the fee structure for this particular program, fee structure is 50,000 rupees per semester without scholarship in LPU. Uh, your fees always depend upon your own caliber. So because we are offering a number of scholarship, uh, we also conduct our own test that is LPU NEST. If you uh, score good in this this test, you can even get scholarship up to 50%. Three slabs are there, 50%, 45%, and 40%. You can get scholarship on the basis of 12 marks as well. So your fees will depend upon your own performance. So let's uh, talk about important dates. Admissions already started in this program from 16th of October, 2023. Last date to take admission in this particular program is 15th of March. So uh, L for LPUNIS, last date to apply is 25th of March. And uh, date of entrance exam would be 15th of February to 29th of February, it was last scheduled. Current schedule will be 26th of May to 10th of April and the result will be displayed within 48 hours. Now, uh, next come uh, next point is how to take admission or uh, how to apply for LPUNIS. For both, you need to go to admission.lpu.in. From this page also, you can click on apply now. Otherwise, you can note the direct link that is admission.lpu.in. Here, you need to register yourself first. With your name, email ID, phone number, you need to mention, uh, verify your phone number uh, by entering the OTP. Your state, city, gender, qualification and discipline would be our humanities or arts, you can say. And then we need to register. All your login credentials will be, uh, you will receive all your uh, credentials through email and message. Uh, once you register, you will be able to take admission. Minimum provisional fees is 15,000 rupees and uh, the fees for uh, LPUNEST program, uh, LPUNEST is 1,000 for male applicants and 500 for female applicants. And uh, that provisional fees is a part of your program fees only. That is not any extra amount. And now if you want to register for further upcoming message, uh, webinars, you, you, you can go to admissions. From here, you will find that here it is written LPU's EduFair. Uh, in, uh, in bracket, there is written webinars. If you will click here, you will be on this particular page. From here, you can check all the upcoming webinars and even you can check the recording of the past webinars. So this was all from my side. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I hope I have covered all the important points. Thank you so much, Rishav, sir, for letting us know so much about lovely professional university. And we are very excited to see you all. Now, moving towards some of the questions that we have received. Some of the questions are really long, so we are probably going to skip those. But um, the few questions uh, I would like to request, I think this one goes to the speakers of the day. So uh, one of the students, one of the attendees, I would say, has asked, uh, what are the, sir, I want to join BA Honours in Political Science and what are the career opportunities in this program? Uh, do, uh, 
our this uh, BA program, we are having the BA general, BA honors, and uh, within the BA, we do have one of the say basket which is specialized in say civil services, uh, wherein we are preparing the students for the UPSC civil services exam. We are offering them the 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 components that are being taught to them that, that are there in the UPSC cell, but we are offering them right from the first year onwards only. So uh, the students who would be say interested in, in joining the civil services, they are uh, advised and they are supposed to just take admission in the, the BA civil services program. Uh, BA honors is meant for the students who are say uh, aspiring to just say uh, explore the subject further in the uh, higher at the higher education level, so they are advised to join the the BA honors and BA generally just say kind of the subject wherein we do uh, teach the range of the subjects. The career opportunities uh, are ranging from they can join the civil services, they can just land in the think tanks, they can be say say uh, yeah yeah exactly uh, the number of number of say uh, say uh, careers that they can just choose once uh, they do choose the BA program. Uh, depending upon their say choice which they are say uh, exercising at the time of admissions well i hope that answers your question uh another question that we have received from a boy named akshat so the question is i want to join lpu uh, in political science department so how is it any difference uh, different than any other university i'm really confused so please help me out <laughs> Yeah, ma'am, yeah, ma I think uh, let's okay. just respond uh, to the question. The first thing is we are awesome. So that's that should answer. And you can't quantify awesome. <laughs> so on a serious note, uh, yeah, uh, if you are exploring the chances of, uh, I mean, uh, joining uh, BA Honors Political Science, we what we have done is we have blended some MA level uniqueness with our BA honor courses. So in our BA honors, we teach you, uh, so what we've done is in our three years, in our six semesters, we start from semester one with the basic theory, but it's not like you will get all theory. So what is the most basic theory with the most basic practical applicabilities. So if we are teaching you political theory in your first year, we are also teaching you international relations in your first year. So the thing is, you read the theory and then you try to apply it. Along with that, we will give you an opportunity to come up with original ideas and thoughts. And not only those thoughts will end up only at your CA level. No. If you, let's say we have this system in your CA, assignment CA, we have introduced a, a gamification activity. Like it's, it's, it's like if you study a concept and you end up developing a flow chart of your comprehension of that concept uh, and it is unique, then we will help you get uh, get it copyright copyrighted on your name. So how many other universities give this opportunity to their BA students where they get copyrights? Besides this, we do have the say uh, component of the term papers. Yes, term papers. projects wherein we are engaging the students with the say, different projects. Research. They are going to the field and doing the research, coming up with the, with the say, report writing and the outcome of this is the publication that's mandatory, that too with the Scopus Index Journal. So this is how we uh, are a bit different from the rest of the universities. I don't think this would be say, say a common phenomenon everywhere. Yes, yes uh, I would like to one thing. Uh, above all, uh, we have a highly secluded uh, faculties in the Department of Political Science. Uh, without any exaggeration, uh, we have faculties, uh, talented, uh, as well as uh, as well as we always take care uh, about uh, of, of our of our students. That is the uh, I think the I mean, best. Multiculturalism is very strong yeah, here. Strong. So we have people so from everywhere. <laughs> we have the representations from the fifty-six countries. So uh, in the that, university, yeah. that itself adds to the cross-cultural, say, diversity of the university. And besides it, 
We do so have Kendri the. Kendri is also very diverse. Yeah. You have people from Punjab, people from Kashmir, people from northeast. Uh, northeast. You have people from west, up na uh, down south. You have people from Central India. So you have people from everywhere, and even academically, uh, you have people from uh, Delhi University, JNU. You have people from University of. Uh, we have someone from Hyderabad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We Amrish sir. Amrish sir. We we have one from Hyderabad, Central University of Gujarat. So we we uh, academically also very diverse, mm -hmm. as well as multicultural. And uh, the other one, one very important thing about uh, honors political sciences that um, it it is also imbibed with the competitive spirit. So we have this club politica that will we be almost bi weekly or uh, twice a month we organize this. Either it will be a discussion or a debate on the issue of current importance. Along with that, there's a lot of intellectual freedom here. You can explore explore all sorts of ideas, and you'll be encouraged. Individually, each of the student is being uh, assigned a mentor, that to a faculty who will be guiding him forward. Even 24 by 7 is supposed to be available for him for any of the issue related to academics, related to his. Say, uh, say any other issue that's being say, taken care of in the LPO. I hope we have made a sense. Yes, to... I well that I hope that answers your question. And as ma'am said, these people are awesome, and three of the best faculties are in this very particular webinar. So you can know what lies ahead from this very particular webinar. And now we are unfortunately coming to the end of this very interesting session that we had. And I just want to say to all of the speakers today, your years of research and your knowledge about the topic and your ability to you know uh, talk about the topic in such an interesting way I think this led attendees have one of the most wonderful sessions and also uh, I, on behalf of the attendees I want to say thank you so much for sharing such incredible knowledge and also to all the attendees I hope this session led, uh, led you guys take better you know decision uh, regarding your admission and I am again, thank you, Dr. Gurjeet, Dr. Javed, Dr. Zahoor for sharing such wonderful knowledge to our attendees. And thank you so much, everyone. I'm your host and we are signing off and we'll see you guys soon in campus. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you.